All right. We're all set up. Thank you guys for waiting. Um, so what are we on? We're on week eight. Uh, today, we're going to get into um, looking at JavaScript for the first time. And so, so far, what we've seen is we've worked with HTML and we've worked with CSS to style the HTML. Uh, as we get into JavaScript, the way we'll be thinking about this is uh, an extension of our web page that kind of allows us to um, add more functionality to it. Because um, right now, we're pretty limited in the things that we can do, right? So far, we can only just display content and kind of like change how it looks. Um, but JavaScript will allow us to do a lot more with it. Um, but before we get into the content, we'll just go over some announcements. Homework 8 will be released today. And this won't be due the Thursday of break. It'll be the Thursday after break. So um, you'll have some time to work on it. And the survey, that should be due end of day today. Uh, it's worth two extra credit points. It's pretty easy. It should only take like five, 10 minutes. So highly recommend you do that. Um, not be accepting any late responses on that one. Uh, grade reports um, will be sent out in the next few days. So keep your emails or just be checking your emails because that's how we'll be sending those. Um, we'll pretty much send a summary of uh, like a point breakdown for each category. Um, maybe check in if we notice that you're under the threshold. Um, but I think you guys should be fine. And yeah, you guys are already here for lecture. So there's only four more after today, sorry, after today, and you need four to pass. So you guys are here. So at most, you should only have to do three more, but I recognize you guys, so probably less than three. Um, and yeah, we'll be releasing the spec of our final project pretty soon. Just to get you guys thinking about it, um, it will be similar to our midterm in, in that uh, we're not providing any code for you guys. Uh, instead, the only difference between the midterm is you won't be following a template. You won't be following any specific guidelines. This is like a very free form project in which you'll be designing a website completely on your own, right? And you'll pretty much have like complete free reign in, in terms of creativity. So um, just get started thinking about that. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll go into that more in a later lecture, but just think about what you might want to create. Okay, let's get back into content. So, um, so far, sorry, let me just double check. I'm not sure if I'm sharing the right screen. Oh gosh, that is so embarrassing. Okay, for my people watching the recorded lecture, sorry. All right, we should be good. All right, so getting into content. Um, yeah, just kind of touching on what I just went over. Uh, we went over, we've gone over HTML, which is kind of the structure of our website, CSS, which is kind of the style or design of it, and then JavaScript will be the functionality. And so these are kind of the, the questions we'll be answering in today's lecture. What is JavaScript? What can we do with it? Kind of what does it look like uh, syntactically? And then we'll go over some basic, basic operations. So what is it? It is a programming language. Yes, HTML and CSS, you might think of as programming languages, but to be super technical, they're not actually programming languages. JavaScript, however, is in that, um, actually I won't go too, too much into it, but that's just kind of a, a technicality. Um, yes, what can we do with that? And so, yeah, we will be using JavaScript to add interactivity to our pages, right? So some examples, um, we have pop-up dialogues, maybe you want, like on your web page to be able to use an image carousel where you tap on an arrow and then it kind of slides the images across. That's something that is very achievable with JavaScript. Uh, and these are just like a few examples to, with what you can do with it. There's a lot more. And so the way we want to think of it is JavaScript will change our existing HTML and CSS in response to some user behavior, right? And so because HTML and CSS control how the web page looks, we now have a new tool that will be able to kind of detect user behavior and then alter our HTML and CSS in response to that. And so that's kind of how we want to think of this model, right? We have some sort of thing that can monitor actions and it can also mess with or alter what is displayed. So that's kind of the, the tool that we have here. And yeah, and so the way we will think of it, sorry, it's a role in a web page is there's nothing inherent about JavaScript that shows up 
on a web website, right? We have our HTML that's loaded by our browser, tells us what content we need, right? We have our CSS, which also tells, talks to our browser to say, these things in my HTML file, this is how I want it to look. And JavaScript, a little different, right? Um, we're not gonna go into how it connects to HTML and CSS this lecture. We'll go into that um, next, or not next week, but the week after spring break. Um, rather today, we're just gonna look at what things it can do just by itself, right? And so for now, we're gonna think of it as living in a completely separate space. Uh, technical terms, it lives in the console. Um, don't worry about what that means, right? We're just gonna be looking at it in isolation, in a bubble. So it won't really make sense. It won't really feel like super tangible today. That's totally fine, right? We just wanna look at, get familiar with it before we kind of connect it to um, our existing frameworks. Um, this is kind of for later, right? So this is for future reference. When we do want our JavaScript to be able to do something with our web page, we need to first link it, just like we link CSS to our HTML, right? And so uh, we have this, uh, syntax here, right? It's going to be called a script tag. We need to indicate the source. So same way we indicate a source for any images, any additional files, um, our CSS, right? We need to specify the correct file path. So in the future, when you do want to connect your JavaScript, um, don't just copy and paste this. You have to make sure that your JavaScript file lives in the, the, the file, sorry, is located at the file path that you're specifying here. So this would only work if your HTML file has or lives in the same folder as an assets folder, and then there's a JavaScript folder within that, and then there is your script.js. If you don't have this exact file structure, this link will not work copy and paste. Okay. Um, and yeah, so you'll be putting this after your body tag. So the, the slight difference is we won't be putting this in our head. Rather, this will live outside of our body tags and then at the bottom. And so we'll kind of show what that looks like when we get there. Okay. And so I'm going to introduce kind of like a mental framework for how we want to think about achieving this interactive functionality. Um, and it's kind of broken into three parts, right? So when we want to introduce or implement a feature into our website that requires JavaScript, these are, there are three main points that you need to think of before you even start coding. Right. If you're if you start trying to write JavaScript without knowing what you're trying to do, um, you're just going to be confusing yourself. Right. So we need to establish our goals first in in this sort of um, framework. Right. And so we can think of adding a feature as these three parts. Right. When the user clicks on, maybe not necessarily clicks on, but when the user interacts with, first we need to identify what we're talking about. Right. What element do we want to target? Is it a button? Is it an image? Is it a link? Right. That's the first step. What is the thing that we want to be interacted with? Right. And then what do we, how do we want our web page to respond? Right. Are we going to add something? Are we going to change something? Are we going to remove something? Are we going to change the background color? Right. These are, this is the next step is what do we want the alteration to look like? Right. And then the last part is, I guess we should actually come first is, what are we going to alter? Okay, so what we want to identify is what is the thing that, I guess you can think of this backwards actually, right? What is the thing we want to change, right? The next part is how do we want to change it? Are we creating it from scratch? Are we changing it? Are we removing it, right? And the last part is what is the target? What is the kind of trigger to cause that change, right? If you can identify those three parts, after we kind of introduce the syntax and get familiar with how everything comes together, then you'll be able to imp implement pretty much any interactive functionality to your website. So this is a very powerful mental model that I suggest um, we keep in mind as we move forward. And so let's go through some examples, right? So the first example we'll go through is, here's our goal. So following the same kind of color convention of the blue as the trigger, the green as the action, and the red as the the kind of destination, right, from here, right? When the user clicks on this image, then increase its size. So we've established a goal in three parts. I'm gonna give you guys maybe some, a bit of time to think about what that might mean in terms of altering our CSS and HTML. So don't even think about 
oh, what code do we need to write to make that happen? Don't think about that. Just think about these individual components. What do we need to target and how do we want to change it to achieve this goal, right? Because this is very much a high level, almost abstract um, definition, right? So just to give you an example of what that answer looks like, increase its size in English might be translated to change its CSS width or height or both, right? Because if you can change the CSS width or height, then you can change its size. And that's essentially what we're doing here, right? So this answer doesn't necessarily address the this part. Like, how do we detect when a user clicks on it? Again, don't worry about it. Just think about the individual components, right? We just want to translate our goal in English to our goal in CSS or HTML. All right, so let's think about this next thing. When the user clicks on some button, you want to change the colors to dark mode. I'm sure if you guys have um, navigated some more modern websites, it'll give you an option to look at it in light mode or dark mode, depending on you know your preferences. Maybe it's easier on your eyes. So what does that mean in terms of CSS or, or HTML? So I'll offer this. Um, when we're deciding if it's something that needs to be changed within the HTML, that's going to be something that relates to the content. If you want to change the words, you want to change the paragraph or the text or something, you'll be, you'll be working with your HTML. If you want to change the color, the style, the size, anything that CSS deals with, you'll be changing CSS. And so I'll give you guys a bit of time. If you think you have an idea, there's like actually many answers to this. There's not one specific answer. Um, feel free to raise your hand. So what does it mean to change colors to dark mode? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because this is a visual change or a stylistic alteration, right? We're not going to look at the HTML. We'll probably keep the content the same. It's just how it appears. And so change colors to dark mode. Yeah, absolutely. Background color. Maybe the color of the text, right? If your text is black, and you only change the background to black, you, you kind of can't see the text anymore, right? So you kind of have to invert both, right? So hence why we have color and background color. Um, but yeah, absolutely right. That's kind of how we want to think of things, right? Just narrow down the scope to what CSS attributes we want to change or HTML. Next thing, maybe your website has a bunch of tabs, like a, like a file system, right? And you want to be able to click through and every time you click on a new one, uh, kind of like on, on your browser, right? You want to display different content. You want to change the content. Um, what might that look like? All right, what does change the content mean? Like, again, this can mean a lot of things, right? This can mean like it slides through. Maybe this goes away, this shows up, right? This one's a little trickier, I will say. So I'll just move on to it, give you guys some time. All right, let's look. Change the content. What does that mean? Well, it could mean you hide the first div and then you show the second div, right? If you have your divs stacked on each other, right? And then only one div has display block, the rest are display none, then you have one div showing. And if you want to kind of shuffle through them and bring other ones forward, then maybe you'll set this one to display none and this one to display block. So that's one possible way of achieving this in code, right? Again, there's a lot of different options. You can maybe use opacity if you want, um, but this is just one approach. Last example, and then we'll be done with this slide. When the user clicks on the up arrow, then increase the number. Ooh. Will we be changing the CSS or the HTML? Can I get a thumbs up for CSS and a uh, actually, <laughs> raise your hand if you think it's the HTML. Don't worry, the recording doesn't see you guys. Raise your hand if you think we're going to change the HTML. All right, hands down. Raise your hand if you think we're going to change the CSS. Okay, so split between two people. <laughs> okay, um, totally fine. So again, going back to this, um, we change the HTML when we want to change the content, right? We change the CSS when we want to change the appearance. So if we're increasing the number, I, this is like the most tricky one. We've never seen how we can do this, but a hint is the number is probably in your HTML, right? 
if you have the number like 10, right, you're not going to specify that in your CSS. You're going to put it in some div, in some, I don't know, in between some tags in your HTML. So you need to somehow grab that number, mess around with it, and then put it back. Um, did we even know we can do that? No. So I apologize for that trick. But JavaScript can. right? So increase the number. Translates to take whatever numbers inside the div, add one to it, change the div content to this new number. Right. So this will be an HTML change. Right. And so I'm going to move on from the slide because we've been on it for a while. And I just want to go over this. I'm sure as I was going through the slide, you probably thought to yourself, like, how was I supposed to know JavaScript could do that? Right. Totally fine. Right. The limits of JavaScript are not clearly defined in some rule book. And if you're ever not sure what you can do with it, just Google it. So for example, if you want your website to like generate new divs on the spot, your first question is probably, can I even do this? Right? This seems a little ambitious. What does the code look like if I were to be able to do it? Right? As you encounter those mini hurdles, just Google it. Because chances are someone else thought that same thing and then someone else already did it. And it's there for you on the internet. So um, yeah, the capabilities of JavaScript, almost endless. Literally every time I think of like a new feature, I'm like, there's no way this can be done. Turns out the creators and maintainers of JavaScript are keeping you guys in mind and they're creating new ways to achieve it. So yeah, truly the limits are, no, but the possibilities are endless. Okay, so I'm gonna pause really quick. What questions do we have? Maybe I'll open this up to you guys asking if you have maybe an idea about a website, like, hey, I, I'm thinking maybe I want my website to do blank. I will do my best to improvise and give you a JavaScript solution, like verbally, if you wanna like maybe come back to it. Literally, there's nothing, nothing wrong. I'll start with the TA so there's less pressure. Um, any TAs, think of something your website might do JavaScript related. Or, or no, think of any interactivity and I'll try to come up with something. I feel like I'm doing an improv show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if I want to change, or sorry, press a button to change a photo. So the button is maybe separate from a photo. So how can you do that? You detect the button press with some JavaScript thing. You just you select the photo and then you change its style to display none. And then you select a different photo and then you set its display to block. Boom, you change the photo with a button press, right? That's actually a pretty common one. You might see in our assignments later. Okay, any other suggestions now to the class? What other things might you want to see? So if you already have some ideas for your final, that's that's totally great. And maybe you want to get a head start. I applaud you. Um, are there any any things you might want to have clarified? Okay. Yeah. 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 Think of JavaScript as literally everything else that you need for your website. Anything that has to do with timing, JavaScript can do it. Anything that has to do with like crazy motion, probably JavaScript. You want to make a game? JavaScript. So yes, that will that will be there. Any others? Thank you for that. Okay, we'll move forward. Um, all right, so let's look at what we're going to learn within JavaScript. So today's concepts, we're going to be going over variables. This is going to be probably the most important part, uh, second most important part. Um, we're going to go over what is this console.log? What does it mean? What does it do? Uh, alert, you can kind of zone out for a little bit. Uh, strings, I would say lock back in because this is important. And then functions, that's going to be the biggest step into making this useful to us. And so by the end of today, we're going to hopefully just be able to read some JavaScript syntax, understand what it's saying, what it's doing, kind of construct our mental models. Uh, and, and just do math. And so an introduction to variables, right? There's two parts. Well, there's two parts to variables. There's the declaration and there's the initialization. Big words. But basically, 
we're telling the program, hey, I want you to know that I'm creating a thing, right? That's the declaration. You're literally just saying there is an existence of something, right? Initialization is the actual assigning a value to that thing, okay? And that can be something like a number, it can be text. Really, those are the two most important things. So to kind of give you guys a more relatable example, in your math classes, maybe you've seen in like proofs, you might've seen like, let K be five. Well, the declaration is let K, right? Because you're essentially saying, I'm gonna create this thing that I'm gonna call K from now on, right? This is separate from the B5, right? You're just saying, there's a thing that I'm creating, it's called K, right? And the initialization is the second part where you assign the value to it. Now, this seems like really straightforward, like why are we going into it? But it's important because this will kind of relate to the syntax when we wanna write our code. So if you do wanna create a variable, right? You have to do these two parts to say, I'm creating a variable, this is its name, and the next part is, this is what the value I want it to be. Yeah. And most variables, they can be redeclared, right? You can just, maybe I want to change K to 10 later. You can totally do that, right? So you can redeclare it and you can redefine it or reassign it. All right. So finally getting into some JavaScript code. It's basically the same thing that we saw before that let K be five. Maybe we want instead a variable to track the name of something, right? And the name for this example will be Joe. So let is kind of our keyword to say, hey, we're creating a variable, right? Whatever comes after that let, so let space is then the name. In this case, the name is also the name. So that's a little confusing, right? But let name, so that's our variable name. And then equals is telling us, okay, we're about to assign a value to it. If we want that value to be a string, we got to put it in quotes, right? So if you had Joe without the quotes, that's a totally different thing. So if you want to create a string called name and assign it to Joe, this is how you do it, right? And then the next thing is maybe we want to create a number and we want that number to represent Joe's age. So what we can do is we can say let again to say we're creating another variable, age is the name, and then 20 is our value. Remember your semicolons. This is just kind of like a syntactical thing. Semicolons tell the program like end of the line. Right. And then you're going to create a new line. So essentially what we've done with this code is there's some variable called name and it stores the value Joe. There's some variable called age and it stores the value 20. If I ever reference age in the future in this code, I'll be actually talking about the number 20. Right. So this is kind of a way to organize your data and also just um, store things that might need to be changed in the future. I'm actually going to skip over these slides. We'll review it at the end. If I forget, please remind me. Um, but yeah, whenever you want to create a variable, it's let and your name of the variable equals and then the value. Okay, so let's look at something else. Um, string concatenation is just fancy speak for put some words together, right? So similar to, it's actually not similar to adding numbers. If you want to put two like pieces of text together, well, first we'll need to define it, right? So we set name to be Nicholas in this case. And whoa, what's going on? We're creating a new variable called greeting and we're using some math, but on words. What does that look like? So. Greeting equals, we have howdy, space, and then end quote. Now we have plus, and then we have name, another plus, and then an exclamation mark. What is greeting? Well, I'm sure many of you guys have already guessed, but it's just that. It's you just put things together in the order that they're specified. So if you want to add text together that was previously defined and stored in variables, this is your solution. Okay, cool. Uh, next thing. We kind of looked at this in our like topical summary. What is console.log? Um, yeah, again, we haven't connected this to HTML yet. Console.log allows you to essentially print out something to be displayed so you can kind of check 
the value of a variable. Let me reword that. So for example, let's look at this, right? We set our name to Nicholas, right? We set greeting to howdy, and we know this turns into howdy Nicholas. Um, but that alone, we don't really know if it would print out howdy Nicholas. So how do we check it? Well, we'll call, so I'm gonna use this term call. We're going to write console.log and then in parentheses, whatever we put in the parentheses, that's gonna be what's displayed to us. So if we wanna check that, the value of greeting is as expected. We'll put it in the parentheses and then the result will be whatever greeting is. Yeah, so console.log is just kind of a convenient way of checking, um, hey, is, my, is this variable what I expect it to be, right? Because as we create more complex code, um, it's gonna be harder to just track things and do things manually. Why not just get that instant feedback? And so console.log will be your best friend in a few weeks. All right, alert, this one's not so important. So if you need to like chill out for a little bit, go for it. Um, alert is like the same thing, except it forces your browser to put this like pop-up dialogue in front of your screen. And then you have to like exit out of it either by pressing like okay or the X button, right? Um, is it useful? No, maybe it is if you wanna make like a joke, like a meme website. Um, but essentially it does the same thing as console.log, just more in your face. Okay, let's run through some code and let's try to see where we are in our understanding. Let's course equal WDD. What does this mean? We have a course variable, it stores WDD. Okay. We have a person variable, it stores I. We have an emotion variable or it's just called emotion. And it says love. And we're creating a sentence variable. Hmm. Person plus emotion plus course plus exclamation mark. What will this print out? Well, nothing, right? It won't print out anything, but if we want to check what sentence is, we'd probably do console.log sentence. Um, what is sentence? What do we think? Anyone want to take a stab at this? Well, I think it's probably I love WDD exclamation mark. Uh, oh, what happened? So that's the other thing is when you do string concatenation, uh, the spaces don't just exist automatically. It will just put the pure text side by side. And so if you notice, why did this happen? Why is there no space? Well, person doesn't have a, there's no space after the I, right? There's no space before the love. They're just words without any, yeah, without any space. And so if you were to run this code, this is what would be outputted. So just a small little quirk meant to trick you guys, right? And if we were to do this alert sentence, what would happen? Well, we'd have some sort of pop-up dialogue that prints out that, that phrase. Okay. And then some basic math. Let's see. So we have some operations or operators. We have the plus sign, we have the minus sign. The asterisk is used as multiplication. The forward slash is division. Uh, the percent sign we'll get into later. For the records, it's called modulus. Well, let's not get into it though. Um, so let's look at some math, right? So let age equals, remember we can use numbers, not just text. If we say let age equals 20 plus five, well, our age is gonna be 25, right? In that single line, the computer does a lot of things, right? It's saying, oh, okay, so there's a variable I need to keep track of. Its name is age, cool. 20 plus five, let me figure that out really quick. Let me put it all together. And so your end result will be, you'll have an age variable that's set to 25. Now, if you wanna change that age variable later down the line, do we have to say let age equals, you, you could, right? But we already told the computer, the program to hold some age variable. So we don't need to go through that process again. We can just reference it. We can say, hey, that age variable I told you about earlier, I'm gonna change its value, right? So that's why we don't have to include the let for this. And so once it's declared, you don't have to declare it again. 
Um, and I want it to be 20 minus 2.5, whatever that evaluates to, right? And so in this case, age would be now 17.5. All right, next thing, we can reference age in, in the future, right? So let double age, we're creating a new variable and we're sending it to age times two. Age, or sorry, double age will be two times whatever age was. So that's one example of how we can use math in our lines. Now, you're probably thinking like, how is this useful? Like, why would I need to write 20 minus 2.5? I can clearly say it's 17.5. This is kind of like a very um, like fundamental application of it, this isn't super practical, right? But if we were to use variables in the place of these numbers that we might not necessarily know the values of at the time, then you can see how it's useful, right? So really you wouldn't do something like this in your code if you know the values up front. So I just want to kind of clear that up. Um, then yeah, one more breakpoint. What questions do we have so far? Questions about what we can do with math. Ooh. Why might it be useful? Okay, let's move on. All right, so this is the part where I think you may need to pay attention just because if you're gonna use JavaScript ever, you're going to be using functions. And so a function is, we're gonna bring this back to the math analogy. It does two things, I guess three things. It first takes in an input. What does it do with that? Well, it does something to it. Maybe it multiplies it by two, maybe it uh, reverses it, maybe it adds something to it, right? It does something to that input or with that input. And then from there, it spits something out, right? So functions can just be thought of as something that receives an input, does some process, and then returns an output. We're gonna use that uh, word return to mean kind of output. So let's break it down. This is not scary. We've seen these curly braces before, but they mean something a little different in this context. First thing we need to do syntactically when we want to define some sort of process, define a function, is we need to write the word function. This is kind of a key word, right? So function tells our program, hey, we're gonna define a function. Whatever comes right after that, that's the name of the function. So in this case, the function is called square. Directly following the name will be an opening and a closing parentheses. That will just always be there. Whatever's within those parentheses is what we're gonna be calling our parameters. Parameters, another name for your input. It's just kind of like a technical thing. And okay. so we have our function, whatever the name of the function is, our parentheses, and then inside the parentheses is our parameters, singular or plural. Following that, we have our curly braces, our opening and our closing to kind of define the bounds of what lines of code are related to our function. And then everything in between our curly braces, uh, that's going to be what the function does. In this case, it's a pretty short one, right? There's only one line. You just take your input and you return uh, whatever it is times itself. So I'm sure we can kind of assume, but we're taking in a number and then we're going to square it and then we'll just spit that out. That's kind of what we're trying to achieve here. So let's try making our own function. Take a good long look at this. All right, cool. Make our own function. So let's make a function that returns uh, our inputted number, so our parameter, but times two or mm, double. I guess I kind of gave it away. What's the first line? Well, we need to write function and maybe some name that relates to what our function's doing. The name doesn't really matter, but I would suggest you name it something that relates to what it does. Again, the parameter, this, we saw it was x before, now it's n. You, again, you can name it whatever, but the key point is that you should name it something that relates to what that parameter is so you don't like lose track of it, okay? And while this only takes one line, we just return two times whatever our number is. And we close it off and we're done. Nice. Um, what about a function that returns double our input a number and then plus one? Um, we'll call it double plus one. 
And we can just do that surrounded in parentheses, right? So this is a way to kind of make sure you don't run into any like pandas issues because I personally don't really remember it. Parentheses kind of eliminate ambiguity. And we close it off. Okay. So pretty basic functions. Again, not super useful yet, but let's see how we might use them. Okay. So kind of going back to our previous example, uh, we have this function called square. Notice now we've introduced two lines. We've broken it up. The one liner was just as valid. This one kind of breaks it up into two steps where we create some result variable or a variable called result that stores whatever the value is, x times x, our input times itself, and then we return it. So two steps could be summed up in one, totally fine. How do we use this function? Well, when we define our function, similar to CSS animations where by itself nothing happens, you have to reference it somewhere else for it to kind of activate, do its thing. Um, we have to do the same thing. We have to first define it. And then in the future, if we want to use it, what we might do is we might assign its return, its output value to a variable. So we create some variable called y. And then we say equals square. And instead of putting x, we're going to put in an actual value, something that has meaning. In this case, five. That's very tangible, right? What will the function do? Well, OK, we're going to say let y equals square of five. Immediately, your program kind of jumps to the definition of square, says, OK, what am I going to do? What does square do? Um, well, it takes in a variable, five, OK. Uh, let result equals, in this case, x stands in for five. So let result equal five times five. So result is 25. And then return result. What does that do? Well, return result is throwing the number 25 to something. Where is it throwing it to? It throws it to whatever reference it, right? Think of square as a, as a function. Think of it as something that kind of just sits and waits. And as soon as there's a call to it, it's like, oh, got to do work. It does its work, and then it ships it off. And it ships it off to where, whoever called it. So in this case, return result throws the value 25 to whatever was asking for it. In this case, it's kind of like this equal sign. So now y is 25. If we call let z, or if we write let z equals square y, we call the same function. y stores the value 25. So then 25 will be put into that machine. And we'll get, what's 25 times? 625? Yeah. Moving forward a little, we can have multiple parameters in our function. So we don't just have to have one single one. If we want to have multiple parameters, well, then we'll just separate them with commas. And then we'll just use them as we would with a single. And if we want to use this function, well, you would just make sure you specify at least it has to be one to one, right? If you only put one parameter in, the function's not going to work. It has to be whatever it's looking for. So, yeah. And if we want to use our functions, right? So bring back this double. Ooh, similar to what we saw before, could we say two times n plus one? Sure. But if we want to use the function within our function, we can also, sorry, that's not this slide, my bad. This is kind of going over what we just said. It's this one. All right, so we can, re we can reference a function within a different function. So you can pretty much call them anyway. Okay. All right, we're almost done. I'm sorry, I'm taking a long time, but I just want to be super thorough about this. Uh, yeah, so the other thing is functions don't always have to return a value. There doesn't always have to be something that's waiting to receive a value on the other end. Um, it can just do a thing. And so if we have this show greeting function that uh, takes in some variable that we're going to call name, uh, maybe we want to set some greeting equals, we saw this before, howdy plus the name plus exclamation mark, and then alert it. And so a single line of code might look like this, where we write show greeting and then put in some text. What's going to happen? Well, it'll pop up that dialogue box and then show miles. So when we write the function again, and then put in a valuable, a tangible value, a tangible value into the parentheses, that's telling our program, okay, now execute that function. Um, 
We're almost done. This is just like a, a small syntax thing. I'm sure you guys have done comments in HTML or CSS where you comment a line and then your program ignores it. What that looks like in JavaScript is just two forward slashes. So two forward slashes and then that line is ignored. If you want to mul comment multiple lines, it's just like CSS. It's a forward slash and then asterisk followed by an asterisk and a forward slash. Cool. Uh, what is returned in this one? Let's think about it. I'll give you guys like 30 seconds to think about it and I'll give you guys a solution. We define some function. We have all the tools necessary to solve this, right? We have some parameters. We do something with those parameters. Uh, cool. And then we set something equals to do something with these parameters. What do we think will be the output string? Right. So probably right now your eyes are probably jumping back and forth. We're like, okay, res is what's returned. Uh, res is I have taken plus course. Okay, what's course? Uh, course is the first parameter. Well, what do we call course? Oh, WDD. That makes sense. Uh, okay, go back to this. So I've taken WDD. Uh, there's a space. Um, num. What's num? Okay, num is here. Num was 10, right? But we did something to the 10. We did something to num, right? We changed it to itself plus 90. So by the time we get to this line, num is actually 100. And so what this string will output is I have taken WDD 100 times. Nice. All right. That was a lot of content. I apologize. What questions do you have? Okay, uh, really quickly, this is more so for the recording so you guys can reference later because this is super complicated. I'm going to jump all the way back to scoping, which I very quickly skipped over. Anytime we saw a variable created, oh, oh no, do we need a... Oh, Loki, this makes, is this easier? To, would you guys prefer this? Let's keep going. <laughs> and so... Um, oh, wow. Okay. Anytime we created a variable, we use the word let. I'm going to do this like speed run, right? There's other words you can use. You can use var or you can use const. Why would you use these other ones? Well, they have different applications, right? Let is the most universal in terms of its use and it's, you know, the context in which it's used. Uh, really quickly, what is const? If you use const, it's short for constant. And so once you define it and you set a value to it, you can't change it, right? Let is flexible. You can change it. Um, const is not. What is var, right? Var, if anything, seems like the most intuitive choice for a word because it's short for variable. Var is a little weird because when you define it, if I say var name equals Joe, and then I say something later, I say name equals Tim, Basically, the the uh, I'd say the challenge of using var is that you have to keep track of it throughout the entire length of your code, right? Because name here, if you reference name anywhere else, it refers to that same name. Whereas let allows you to kind of componentize, compartmentalize things and keep them separate so that if you accidentally create name here and then way down in your code, you say name again and you want it to be something different and you want them to be kind of separate entities, the way let works, it allows you to do that. And so um, won't get into the specifics. Just know that let is what we're going to use. Yay. OK. Sorry for taking all that time. I think we should move on to the design lecture now. Yeah, who's teaching?